All right, well, I think it's about time to start if we are ready. You ready up there? Okay. Um, hello, my name is John, and I'm. Hello, everybody. And I'm here to talk about the Linux kernel development process and how, in particular, to be a part of it. And, um, and in general, how it works. It's a bit of a different talk than I typically do at this conference, so it'll be fun to, to see how it goes. The agenda looks kind of like this. This is very much not a technical talk. It is a process-oriented talk, so it may seem very hand-wavy if you came here wanting to know about how to use adaptive spin locks or something like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about why participation matters, why I'm doing this talk in the first place, really. Some guiding principles, um, sort of overall high-level discussion of how the development process works and things that people are into, some discussion of kernel trees and how paths get into the kernel, and then if uh, there is time, then I'll get into some specific tips about how to avoid common pitfalls in the development process. But I'm actually kind of hoping that I won't have time. This talk works best if people ask a lot of questions and it goes into more discussion-oriented mode. So I really want to encourage people to ask questions or to shout out corrections or to just generally heckle. And we can make this a bit more of a, of a back and forth experience in that. And then when the time runs out, then I'll simply stop and um, we won't get into all of that. I've really tried to arrange it so the most important stuff comes towards the beginning of the talk. Um, this talk is derived from a, a document I wrote working with the Linux Foundation, which can be found at that URL. You can also, I think, find it off of their front page. Or if you have a handy kernel tree around, you can find it under documentation slash development process, but only if it's a 2628 tree or, or newer. So you need to be kind of towards the, the front edge, but if you're, if you're not there, then perhaps this is the wrong talk for you anyway. So why does this matter? Why am I giving this talk? Why do we care about being part of the kernel development process? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Starting with the, the basic fact that the kernel is the core of a functioning Linux system. If the kernel does not support what you want to do or if it supports it poorly, it's almost impossible to fix this up at the higher levels of the system. So the kernel really needs to be the best that we can make it be. So if you want the kernel to, to meet your needs in particular, then you really want to be part of this process of getting it there. In fact, participation is how you get the kernel to, to meet the needs that you have. I was recently at a conference run by an embedded systems, an embedded Linux vendor, and one of the founders of that company got up and he complained, in a sense, he said that the center of gravity for Linux kernel development is really enterprise computing, and the embedded was an afterthought, if anything at all, that the Linux kernel really wasn't developed with embedded systems in mind. This was partially a reason to be buying their particular product. Um, but he also acknowledged that the real reason for this was that the embedded systems vendors are not working with the process in the same way that the enterprise systems vendors are doing. The people who are inter interested in the enterprise market are actually putting their work into the kernel. They're participating. They're driving the kernel in that direction. If you want the kernel to meet some other need, in particular your particular needs, then you need to be part of this process and to drive it there because otherwise it's not going to happen. That's how it works in this, in this world. You can't just sort of sit there and complain and say, I wish it worked this way without actually being a part of um, getting it there. So that's a good reason for doing kernel development, but not necessarily a reason for being part of the process and getting this code upstream. There, there are a number of reasons for that, starting with the simple fact that out-of-tree code is very expensive. Anybody who has watched the way kernel development works over any period of time knows that APIs within the kernel change frequently. A lot of stuff changes very frequently within the kernel, even though we try very hard to keep the user space APIs very stable. So any code which is not in the mainline kernel tree will fall behind in every development cycle as the internal so the kernel change. So if you were maintaining code outside of the mainline kernel, you're on this continual treadmill of having to keep that code working as the kernel changes out from underneath it. It's a very expensive process. It's a real pain. It's not any fun at all. Anybody who has done this 
for any period of time and has dragged a set of patches forward for any period of time knows that it's a lot of work. It's very expensive. And it's something that you really just don't have to do once you get that code into the main line, or at least you do an awful lot less of it. So that's one reason for, for getting your code into the main line. But beyond that, it has been seen over and over again that code which is outside of the mainline kernel is invariably lower quality code. The number of exceptions to this are really just about insignificant. Whenever a body of code that has been outside of the mainline gets brought in and exposed to a rather higher level of light and, and um, inspection, there's a whole bunch of problems that always come to light. Things get fixed. Things get improved in a hurry. Once you get your code into the mainline, it becomes better code. Anything that you are maintaining outside is not only more expensive to do, but it's going to be lower quality stuff that you are hanging on to. And that really is true without exception. Beyond that, once the code's in the main line, other people can work on it. They can improve it. And so you can often get stuff in there and see that it gets better without any real input on your part. A while back, I was um, contracted to write the camera driver for the one laptop per child system, and that went into the main line a couple of years or so ago at this point. Just this very day, I got a, an email from one of the Video for Linux developers saying, well, we've reworked a lot of these APIs. The stuff is a whole lot cleaner than it was when you wrote that driver. I would like to go into your driver and fix it up and make it use these new APIs. So it will be simpler code and more robust and all the good stuff that I hope comes with this new API that they have put in for video for Linux drivers. So I thought this is pretty cool because I don't have to do this work. I've been sort of thinking about looking at it. But now it's going to happen because the video for Linux people want to, to bring the drivers up to the newer frameworks that they are putting in there. You see this happen all over the kernel. As people go and they improve things, if your code is there, they will improve it with it. If you keep your code outside of the mainline kernel, then you miss out on this, and it, it doesn't happen for you. And finally, this is simply how our community works. If we didn't have people participating in the process and putting their, their code into the kernel, we wouldn't have a kernel. Or we would have this um, you know, simple little thing that was never going to be all fancy and nice like the GNU system. Right? But since we do have this community around it and people working with it, we have the kernel that we have. Tomorrow we want to continue to have this kernel, even a better one. This is how it works. This is the, the, the coin of the realm, so to speak. So if, if this is something that is important to you, then, then being part of it should be important to you. So these are all reasons why I think this is important and why I give talks like this. In fact, a lot of people give talks like this, trying to encourage better participation in the process. So this particular talk was motivated by some things I saw. Um, over time, I have realized that working with the kernel development process really isn't all that hard. The fact that every two to three month development cycle contains the work from over a thousand developers should make that fairly clear. There are lots and lots of people who are managing to do this, and they do it very well. But every now and then, you see somebody who comes along and they don't really understand how the process works and they just bounce off of it. The kernel community, like any other community of, of this sort of size, community involving thousands of people, has developed a whole set of procedures and rules and conventions for how it works, just to make things work smoothly. If you don't pay attention to those conventions, you are not going to work smoothly with the development process. So I want to just talk a little bit about how some of those conventions work, because if you come in and you try to ignore them, you get into situations where developers get very frustrated, things don't go the way they want them to do, and then they generally throw a temper tantrum and they storm off and they're never seen again. And I have seen some very talented people, people with energy and ideas that we really want to have in our community, run into this sort of thing because they, they fail to understand how the process works and they leave and we don't see them again. And it's, it's really their loss and it's our loss too. So I'd like to see less of that, so that's why I am here talking to you. So we'll start with some, again, some sort of high-level guiding principles that I have seen people run afoul of over time. And again, I really I encourage the asking of questions if people have questions about the stuff that I'm talking about, or else you're just going to have to listen to me sort of ramble on about this stuff. But it, it works well if people have, have things that they want to um, expand upon. So 
First and foremost is a principle that is often described as the upstream first rule. The idea being that if you've got code that you've written, you want to distribute it, first thing you do is you get it into the upstream kernel. Then you send it out to your customers or you package it in your product or you do whatever else you're going to do with it. But you want to get it into the mainline kernel first. There's a number of reasons for this, including the fact that code generally needs to change on its way into the mainline. It gets better. If you've shipped it first, then you've shipped the code that is, that is missed out on this improvement process and, in fact, may well be incompatible, say, in user space with the code that does make it into the kernel. I've seen a number of vendors and others run into this kind of trouble where they ship something, then they try to merge it, and what gets into the main line in the end is not what they shipped, and they run into a lot of trouble with that. The upstream first rule is also part of a, a more general principle that was um, articulated very well by Andrew Morton some years ago at a keynote in Ottawa, where he asked people working with the kernel, especially in the commercial area, to not differentiate their products at the kernel level that whatever value you're adding, you should add it at the higher levels of the system. But at the kernel level, we're all working on the same kernel, a common kernel, something that we can work on together and make, the, make it be the best that we can have it be. So this really is, in a sense, just a restating of the upstream first rule. But it's, it's a different view of it for, for the people, especially on the commercial side. And the, the nice fact of the matter is that this rule is pretty well observed at this point, certainly not universally, and there are problem areas in places. But to a great extent, the people who work with the kernel and the companies who work with the kernel do not use their kernels as the differentiator for their products. They, they put their work into there and they add stuff higher up in the chain. One of the core principles of kernel development is that technical quality matters really above just about anything else. It matters a whole lot more than any company's specific plans as to when they wanted to ship a particular code or what they wanted that body of code to look like, anything like that. It matters a whole lot more than the desires of a particular body of users that are out there. It matters more than any kind of existing, we've done it this way for years sort of practice. And it even matters more than the status of even the, the highest level kernel developers who may wish to get something in there, but if there are technical issues with it, they will have trouble with it. No free software project wants to merge low quality code, but I think that the kernel is more intransigent in this area, more insistent on technical quality than just about any other project with, with few exceptions. There are some others that have a similar sort of um, of sense there. Part of this ties into the, the longer term view which is taken in the kernel development community. A lot of people who write code do so because they have something that they want to have work right now. We want to ship it now. The people who have been working on the kernel for a while have figured out that five years from now, ten years from now, chances are awfully good they're still going to be working on the kernel and they're going to have to deal with whatever code that you are trying to get them to merge today. So whenever somebody reviews a piece of code, they're almost certainly going to be thinking, what's it going to be like to maintain this five years from now? What's it going to be like ten years from now? Is this going to drag us down? Are we going to be able to keep it still going in good shape many years from now? Recently, there's been a lot of um, activity in the file systems area, and I'm starting to see people posting concerns that every file system we add to the kernel makes it that much harder to change the way file systems work over time. And as we add more and more of these things, it's going to serve to kind of fossilize that part of the kernel a bit. People are actually worried about that, even though we want these file systems, because they're always thinking, what's it going to be like five years from now? This is really one of the key aspects of kernel development is what keeps our kernel still vital, still functioning after, after all these years so far and will continue to do so many years into the future. Okay, another aspect of the, of the process, this is of course a more general free software development pr principle, but you see it a lot in the kernel, is that a peer review? The idea that no code as initially written is perfect, that it always needs other people to look it over. It can always be improved. The, um, 
a state of review in the kernel is perhaps not as good as we would like it to be. There's an awful lot of code that is being written. There are a lot more people writing code than there are reviewing code. This is, again, not a problem which is unique to the kernel by any stretch, but it is certainly one that we are seeing. So I certainly can't stand up here and say that every bit of code that goes into the kernel is going to have to go through this whole long review process first. It would be nice if we had everything reviewed very well. It doesn't always happen. But in general, somebody tries to look at a lot of the code, at least most of the code, that goes into the kernel. That's part of the process. So one of the things that results from this is that code which is submitted for inclusion in the mainline kernel will almost certainly be subject to requests for changes. Please make it work this way. You can improve it that way. You can um, make it work with these layers over here. Please don't duplicate that functionality over there. All this sort of stuff that is part of the review process. And if you, as a developer, do not engage with that review process, if you ignore what the reviewers are telling you, then your code's not going to go anywhere. And you'll find very quickly that your, your submissions are not getting much attention anymore. This is a place where a lot of people fall down. They, they put the code out there and they say, OK, it's done now. But it's not done. It's really not done at that stage. In the kernel realm, developers are individuals. They may be working for a company. They are certainly working towards that company's goals. But every developer engages with the kernel community as an individual. If you ever respond to a reviewer by saying, well, you're just saying that because Red Hat doesn't want my code in the kernel, you're going to find yourself ignored very quickly. It just doesn't work that way. These developers are representing themselves, and they're really working towards the kernel first and um, towards their company's objectives after that, with very, very few exceptions. I think a lot of these developers know that they could well be working for a different company next year, but they'll still be working on the same kernel and working in the same community. There is no ownership of code that you put into the kernel. This is something that tends to surprise people sometimes. You say, OK, I've written this driver. I put it into the kernel. This is my driver. You guys don't touch it. But everything that you put into the mainline kernel goes in there under a free software license. And the kernel community takes those licenses seriously. They have the right to distribute it. They have the right to change it. And if somebody else thinks that your particular code needs to be changed in a certain way, there's only so much that you can do to block that. And if you try to say, well, I'm sorry, this isn't what I had in mind for this code. I'm doing things. Please don't go there. People will listen to you. They'll try to understand why it is you don't like a particular change. But they will route around you if you're trying to block stuff that, um, that needs to go into the kernel. There's a certain file system developer who who put one version of his file system in the kernel and then was working on a later version. And he worked very hard to block the addition of some important features, such as extended uh, attributes and so on, to the earlier version of the file system because he wanted it to be stable and because he really wanted to motivate the, the merger of the later version of his file system into the kernel. But um, it didn't go that way. He was, he was not listened to in this regard. And those changes did go into his file system, a change which at this point I think nobody would regret. Um, you, see, you see similar things in other parts of the kernel. I've seen driver developers who say, you can't touch my driver. But people will go around it. And if you do that long enough, you end up losing control over the code entirely. There is just no ownership of it once you put it into the kernel. Free software is about giving up control. That's simply the way that works. No regressions. Do not, um, do not break things, even if you're trying to fix other things. Not that long ago, an obscure developer named Alan Cox tried to put in a driver fix, which he swore would fix about 10 systems for every one that it broke. And it seems like a good trade-off. You make things work for a whole lot more people than it did before. But that change did not go in. And things that are known to cause regressions generally do not go in, or they will come back out again if they are seen to cause regressions. For the simple reason that if you, have, if you ensure that kernels that work for people now continue to work for people in the future, then you have a pretty good sense that your kernel is getting better over time. If you allow things to break, then you never really know anymore. So there is a, a pretty strong ethic towards not, letting, not breaking things. And I think that has gotten stronger over time. It has gotten um, 
people have started to pay more attention to this over the last few years in particular, really trying not to put regressions in and to not tolerate them when they show up, to pull them out by whatever means necessary. So if you try to fix something by breaking something else, you're going to run into trouble. There is um, no inherent right to inclusion. Just because you've written a bunch of code does not give that code any particular free pass into the kernel. Changes require justification. If the development community as a whole thinks that there's not a, a reason, a good reason for your change, if they think that the problem you're solving is not the right problem, or if it's not considered not to be a problem at all, or if there's a better solution, something like that, then your code may not go in. I was talking with Rusty yesterday, and he, he estimated that less than half of the patches he writes actually make it into the kernel. And you'll see this happening in, in fairly big ways at times. Um, many years ago, there was a project called the Extended Volume Management System. It was done out of IBM. They put considerable resources into making this nice volume manager with a whole lot of nice user space tools. And it really looked like it was on the path into the kernel to be the volume manager that would be for the 260 kernel. But there was another thing called the device mapper that came out of a small company called Sestina. And over time, as developers looked at it, they decided they liked the device mapper code a whole lot better. In the end, that code went out, even though there was this very big company that was pushing for the inclusion of a different body of code. Now, the EVMS developers, I think, maybe went out and drank a whole lot of beer that night. But after that, they, they came to terms with it. And they said, OK, we'll work with this. We'll pour our tools over this. And life went on. And um, one assumes that we had a better kernel for all. Some other developers will um, throw a tantrum when something like that happens. But you really need to be focused on seeing that the problem gets solved, as opposed to being really focused on your particular solution. If you do that, you'll be happier with how things go in the kernel over time. So that's kind of my overview of, uh, of high-level guiding principles. So we can move on to more mechanical stuff if there are no questions. I guess everybody's asleep. Do things get pushed out of the kernel? Um, things will certainly get pushed out of the kernel if um, if there is a better solution or if if it is seen as being problematic for various reasons. A classic example of that would be a, a system called DevFS, which was one intended solution to the profusion of, of device numbers and a more dynamic device environment and so on. But DevFS was was really reviled for years before it was put into the kernel. Um, people didn't like the way it put policy into the kernel, and people really didn't like the way it was implemented after they looked at it for time. And so after a few years of being in the kernel, it was actually pushed back out. And what we have now is a user space solution called UDEV, which, which solves the same problem in a way that I think most developers at least like better than they like DevFS. So yes, you see it. Code does get pushed out of the kernel. Uh, for reasons like that, or if it's really clear that nobody is using it. If somebody finds out that a driver has been broken for two years and nobody complained, then they generally won't fix it. You just get rid of it because clearly nobody's using it anymore. Yeah? Is there ever a case for regressions? Well, you know, if you lay down absolute rules, somebody is certainly going to find a... Um, find an exception. I don't know, Linus, has there ever been a good case for a regression? So serious security bugs is being perhaps the only real major case for, for allowing a regression into the kernel. Other than that, I think I think it is. <laughs> 
it's not fun when he laughs in your face. <laughs> so, all right, moving on. Um, this is a section on, on kernel trees. It's just a, a quick overview of, of the path that patches tend to take into the kernel and then out to, to the world as a whole. Yeah, I kind of start in the middle with what's called the mainline kernel. I've been throwing around this term mainline. The mainline kernel, of course, is the, the kernel that Linus maintains. It's what people think of when they think of the Linux kernel. Released every two to three months, um, you know, two, six, whatever. This is the sort of the, the flagship kernel that, that everything follows. But the interesting thing is that, um, well, I'll get into that actually. Talk just briefly about how this is built. Right, two, again, it's the sort of two six series, and so you see these series of of internal kernels, which are called dash RC, whatever, um, where RC doesn't actually stand for much of anything in particular at this point. So you'll see a two six whatever kernel, and then a bunch of code goes in for the next cycle. You see two six um, and plus one RC one, and so on. The way this works is that after a stable kernel release, there's a period of about two weeks called the merge window. This is when all of the significant changes for, for the mainline kernel are supposed to be merged during this time. And in fact, you see this incredible frenzy of patches going in, typically on the order of uh, several thousand. I believe it was about 8,800 change sets for, for 2629 went in. That, that's, that's higher than some, lower than others. But it's, it's an awful lot of stuff that goes in. Then the, the, the RC1 kernel comes out, the merge window is closed, and everything goes into the stabilization period where we're only supposed to merge fixes for serious problems and so on. Now, from what I've seen looking at it, about a quarter of the, the total change sets are merged during the stabilization period. So that's an awful lot of stuff that still goes in. Um, a lot of things to fix, I guess. And they go in during that time. But it has gotten better over the years, and the, um, the definition of what constitutes a fix has been narrowed somewhat. Um, it used to be you could call just about anything a fix and, and maybe get it in there, and things have tightened. So um, things, things have um, narrowed down, and you actually do things stabilize over this period of time. Eventually, the list of regressions gets small enough, and um, the next 2.6 kernel comes out. We are, oops, that was the wrong button. Um, we are currently here. At 2.629 RC2, which was released just literally before Linus hit the road to, to come here. So we will probably see, you know, as many as another half dozen of these coming out about a week at a time or so before we see the actual 2.629 kernel come out. But um, the interesting thing is, while people pay a lot of attention to this particular cycle, because this is how the, the flagship kernel is put together, people don't, not a whole lot of people actually run these kernels. Very few of them do. I mean, maybe a lot of people in this room do. But in general, very few people do. They run various other kernels derived from it. Kind of the first step of that is what's called the stable series. These are important updates to the main line that are maintained by a separate team. Once the main line has moved on to the next development cycle, it contains security fixes, fixes for severe bugs, things like that. These are generally maintained for a couple of development cycles after a stable kernel comes out. So just the other day we saw, I believe, 2627.12 and 2628.1 come out as being the, the latest stable updates for those two stable kernel releases. So those updates are pretty tightly controlled. Uh, you, don't, you don't see a whole lot of extraneous stuff going in there. It's generally important fixes that go in just to further stabilize those kernels. But in fact, very few people run those kernels either. What they run instead are the kernels that they get from their distributors. These kernels are usually based on the stable releases, but they may include significant changes beyond that, depending on what the distributor decides to put in there. Um, in some cases, especially with the more community-oriented, more leading-edge uh, development type distributions, there's not a whole lot of changes that go in there, depending on the distributor. For some other things, and for the enterprise distributions and such, there may be all kinds of stuff that goes, goes in there. And then these kernels, of course, are, are maintained by the distributors in the period of time over which they mean are maintained can vary quite a bit from, you know, say a year or so for Fedora kernels. Um, the, the main server for LWN.net, I kind of I was embarrassed to, to admit this, but until just a few months ago, was running on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 2 system. So I was putting out the kernel news on a, on a kernel that claimed to be 249. 
Um, it's not. It's not even close to 249. But um, that, that's what it claimed to be. And they're still maintaining that kernel, at least at a very, very deep, very stable, if you can actually convince us a security problem exists, we'll fix it sort of mode. Um, so it can go on for a very long time, although those, those kernels are really something severe. I, I heard Dave Jones had the numbers for this. Fedora has something like three developers doing their kernels now because they've managed to beef up the team. The Red Hat Enterprise kernels have a much, much larger team of, of people just doing backports and doing things to maintain those kernels over time. It's a huge, huge job, but they do that. But that's, that's how sort of the, the far end of how, how a kernel change gets out to the users by way of this path from the main line to the distributors. But I haven't really quite talked about how we get into the main line, so we need to take a step back and look at, um, at some of the other trees that are out there, starting with a couple of development trees. Linux Next is a relatively new tree. It's been around for about a year now, I guess, maintained by Stephen Rothwell. The idea behind Linux Next is that it contains all of the changes, or at least most of the changes, which are intended for the next kernel development cycle. So since the current development cycle is, is building 2.629, if you look in Linux Next, you'll see an awful lot of stuff which is intended for 2.630. This is intended primarily, initially, as a, as a place for, to try out the integration of patches. If you are trying to pull together several thousand patches into the merge window over the course of about two weeks, that really doesn't give you a whole lot of time to make all the pieces fit together nicely. So Linux Next was, was developed as a way of allowing this integration process to be done over the course of a couple of months instead of a couple of weeks. And I think it has helped a lot in that regard in terms of making the, the merging process somewhat smoother. It's also a platform for early testing of these patches, although there's not a whole lot of people, I don't think, who are testing um, Linux Next trees or developing against it. Linux Next is a very strange kernel and is kind of thrown away and built from scratch every, every day. So it's something totally different every time around. So it's a very hard development target and it can be a hard thing to test. The other development tree, sort of high level development tree out there is called the MM tree. It's maintained by Andrew Morton. This um, used to be where a lot of this integration worked on and a lot of testing. You see a bit less of it now. It's based on Linux Next. So Andrew starts with Linux Next. Then he adds a whole bunch of patches that he has collected from various sources. Andrew Morton's tree tends to be kind of the tree of last resort for various uh, changes that don't get into the kernel any other way. Um, this is another platform for early testing and so on, but MM has kind of faded a bit from view over over the last few years as Andrew has gotten busy with other stuff and he doesn't release it as often. And I think there are peop fewer people working with the MM tree than there, there used to be. But it's still out there and you can actually download the MM of the minute tree if you want to catch up with what he's looking at at this particular moment. And there are people who do that and you see bugs that are reported against it and so on. But you know, um, in front of these trees, and in particular in front of Linux Next, is a whole set of trees that are called subsystem trees. These are trees that are maintained by somebody who's looking after a specific small piece of the kernel. So there's a subsystem tree for SCSI drivers. There's one for cryptographic code. There's one for the networking subsystem. There's a whole set of, there's, how many trees do you pull? It must be getting close to a couple hundred by now, I would think. There's, there's well over 100 that go into Linux next. There's, there's over 100 that go into Linux next. Maybe you don't see all those in that form. Um, but there's... Right. Right. Um, there's, in any case, there's, there, there are a lot of them. They, they do kind of converge before they make it to the main line. But these are the um, kind of the path into the main line for most kernel work. This stuff doesn't go straight to Linus and so on. It goes by way of one of these subsystem trees and perhaps by way of more than one of them. So in a real sense at this point, the subsystem maintainers are the real gatekeepers into the kernel. These are the people who are reviewing code which is specific to a given subsystem, an area of the kernel which they know very well and for which they have some, some good ideas of how they want it to go forward. So they're the ones who will look at the code and they will say, okay, this is ready for inclusion. No, you need to change these things first. And they'll make the decision as to when they will pull this code into their specific subsystem tree and then eventually send it on to the mainline. 
So they're the gatekeepers. Although it's worth noting that the, their, their power really is not absolute. And if you have trouble with the subsystem maintainer, they can be routed around. And in some cases, in a very strong way, maybe the, the strongest case of this I have seen was, again, just over a year ago now. Um, a guy named Andy Clean was the maintainer for two, two subsystems, being the I386 architecture and the x86-64 architecture. Some other developers came along and they said, okay, you know, actually these two are just this, two versions of the same architecture. And we really need to merge these two together because there's an awful lot of duplicated code and problems being fixed on one side, not on the other, and so on. We would really be better off if we merged all this stuff together. And over time, they, they managed to build a consensus for this, except for the maintainer of the, the existing I386 and x86-64 subsystem trees. In the end, this merger happened over his objections, um, at which point he decided he didn't want to maintain it anymore, and we had a change of maintainers as well. But even, even the, the subsystem maintainer, who in some sense owned these trees, was not able to block this change when there was enough of the community that decided that that was, the cha that was what needed to happen. So nobody really has absolute power, or maybe almost nobody has absolute power. <laughs> so just a little picture to show how, how these uh, trees come together. So you have all these subsystem trees, and as Lena noted before, you've got things like some of the, the networking drivers and wireless stuff which go into the networking tree first. And then over the course of the development cycle, each of these subsystem maintainers will take a version of their tree and they make it, set it out where it can get pulled into Linux Next every day. So every day, uh, Stephen goes and he grabs all these trees and then somehow manages to bash and chisel and hammer them all together into something that he can hopefully build and put out there for, for their testing. And so this, you see things going this way and then it goes into the MM tree for there. Now, when the merge window opens, you might think that all of this stuff just goes from Linux Next into the mainline, but it doesn't actually work that way. Instead, all these subsystem trees are instead put up separately, and then they go into the mainline directly um, from the subsystem tree and not by way of Linux Next. This is, you can think of it as perhaps the, the final review stage here. You know, except it's in the Linux Next does not actually say that this code's going into the main line. It just says that it looks like it is, it's poised for that, it's considered ready for that. But there's still one, one final step where um, you have to convince Linus that it needs to go in there. And he, I don't think, looks at every single patch at this point because there are thousands of them and um, trusts the subsystem maintainers to do a good job most of the time. But um, you, you'll see stuff that, that gets stopped at that final stage because there's, there's something that's not quite right with it. So that, that's kind of the path that um, things take. And the moral of the story is that if you're developing code, what you want to do is to find your subsystem maintainer relatively early on and to target their tree. If you just sort of go on the Linux curl mailing list and say, you know, here's my new code, um, put it out there, you know, it may get picked up by the right people or it may be that, um, that it just kind of falls on the floor because there's an awful lot of stuff on that mailing list. You really need to make sure you're directing things in the right direction, and that's generally not straight towards the main line. You need to go by way of the, of the proper channels. So that's pretty much what I have to say about, um, about trees and the path that patches take into the curl. Any questions on that? Yeah. I, I didn't quite hear that. Sorry. Has Lewis had any of his code blocked? Well, maybe rather than trying to answer that question, um, I'm actually, the thing that keeps me honest is that I'm really, really, really lazy. So the last thing I want to do is do extra work. And when I want code written, what I usually do is instead of writing it myself, I send out these emails and say, here's the pseudo code. Sometimes I send out a patch, but because I'm not willing to test it, because testing is for wimps. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I actually send my patches quite often to the maintainer and uh, say, I think this is how it should be tested. And then I assume that he'll pick it up and I'll get it back. And I will never reject my own code when it gets back, but I won't even notice if they decide to drop it on the floor. So that's how it works. I, I do occasionally commit my own code, but I try to avoid it. I actually quite often try to go through the sub-maintainers. Anything else? <laughs>
All right, the final one. Go ahead. Can you overthrow a maintainer? <laughs> you know, in a sense, they happened with the um, with the x86 architecture, um, and you know, if a, if a maintainer is known to be really problematic, then um, at times you will see that somebody else, you know, either becomes the path by which the code actually flows, even if they're not the nominal maintainer or so on, um, you know, they get routed around. You rarely see somebody actually tarred and feathered and run out of town. But, um, yeah, they, they, they tend to find that they're not getting, they're not getting traction and people aren't listening to them anymore and they get discouraged and they go somewhere else. Until you get one who just likes to fight. What makes a maintainer problematic? Um, during the 2.5 development cycle, there was a maintainer for the IDE subsystem. Now, this subsystem is well known for driving every maintainer that ever takes it on completely nuts. And um, they happen. And this particular maintainer continually put in code that broke things for, for people's systems. And there was a long period of time where it was considered that you could only really develop on the 2.5 kernel if you had SCSI drives, because um, anything on an IDE drive just wouldn't work very well. And so um, he was finally pretty much pushed out, and a lot of his code was, I, I think he gave up. He got tired of people yelling at him, but it took a long time for that to happen. Um, you know, you can get maintainers who decide they just don't like somebody and they don't want to encourage things, or they, you know, they have an architectural disagreement with, with the rest of the community. You see things like that happen. It's pretty rare, though. Um, you know, maintainers are not really in a appointed position or such. You know, it, it kind of tends to come from the bottom up. So, it, it doesn't happen that often. All right. Well, I have. I actually don't have a whole lot more time. I'll go through just a couple more slides, I think, of some, some basic tips I had, and then, um, then I think I will um, stop it there. Looks like I don't have the usual minder here to, to kick me off the stage. I could go all day. <laughs> um, so tips, how do you get started? Sort of some advice to companies and to, um, to elsewhere. This, this tip comes from Andrew Morton, who um, asked me to pass this on in his document. What you see out there is you see a lot of companies saying, okay, we need to get into kernel development. We're going to go out and we're going to hire one of these, these kernel developers that we know about out there on the list. And so you have a lot of companies chasing a relatively small number of kernel developers around and um, trying to woo them away and so on. And this is, makes for a really great environment for kernel developers. Um, but in the longer run, companies who develop their skills in-house end up with happier developers, perhaps those who stay around longer, and end up growing our community that way. So it's really worth trying to develop skills in-house. It's something that can be done. It's not like there's a finite quantity of people who are able to do this work and you have to go out and grab one of them somewhere. Um, get your legal people on board, of course. You don't want to develop all this code and then have the lawyers suddenly saying you can't um, put that out there. See, if you have a company that's big enough to actually have its in-house legal department, then you typically want to identify one of the people there and try to bring them up to sufficient clue that you can actually get this work done without trouble from that part of the world. Um, get your management on board and um, ensure they understand the process. Have them read the development process document. Management is often the, the problem. You know, if you get a manager who says, okay, we can't release this code out onto the kernel mailing list or anything until it's been through our entire internal quality assurance process, then things are not going to work very well because it's going to go out there, there are going to be requests for changes and so on, and if they want to run through this whole QA process again every time um, you need to put out a new version, then things are just not going to work very well at all. So management really needs to understand how this works. And of course, if you are managing developers, let them be part of the process. Let them contribute. Let them be a part of the community. Um, you'll have much happier, more productive developers if you do that. If you're a developer and you want to make a start with kernel development, um, some people go out there and they say, okay, well, I'm going to go through and I'm going to, you know, fix 
all of the white space errors or all of the misspellings of some particular word or something like that. And that kind of stuff doesn't actually help much and it doesn't really teach you how to, how to develop for the kernel or work with the process. So, and Andrew Morton says the first thing you should certainly do is to um, go out there and make sure that every system you have works. If there are problems, fix them. That's the best way to do this. The, the advice that I would add on top of that is to um, become part of the review process. One of the best ways to learn about how kernel code works is to look at an awful lot of it. And um, reviewers are always in short supply for the kernel. If you go and you supply good reviews for kernel code, then you will build a reputation as being a helpful person very quickly and will be very welcome in the community. It can be very um, intimidating to go and to look at some code that's been posted by some big name developer and start saying, to start asking questions about it. But if you do it, if, especially if you ask questions rather than saying, hey, that's all screwed up, um, you'll find that they appreciate your work and you've done your part to make the kernel better, you've learned a lot, and you'll have made a good start in the process. And this, I think, is where I will stop. Um, I've got some more slides. I actually um, put, well, they aren't on the net, but they will be on the net. Um, at that URL if you wanted to see the rest of the stuff that I had. But um, if there's maybe another question, then I would be happy to answer it. And um, then after that, we'll go and have our next session. Yes? What constitutes a good reviewer? A good reviewer is simply somebody who takes the time to really look at the code, to try to understand what it is trying to do and to try to make sure that it fits well into the kernel and that there aren't obvious problems with it. You know, somebody who goes through and says, we have white space problems here, you should have um, indented that comment differently, that sort of thing is not very helpful, right? But if you actually understand the code and you start saying, okay, well, you know, how do you release this lock if you take that path out of this function? Um, things like that, then there's an awful lot you can do. In the, in the process document, I, I list a few things that reviewers can look for. And there's actually a whole lot more that could be added to that. But, you know, anything that you can do that actually makes the code better is, is very helpful. All right, I should get out of the way and let the next, next speaker set up. But thank you all very much.